So this happened about five years ago when I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and fifteen year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with a very low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall and we ended our shopping pretty late and the mall stores were starting to close. So I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finished up eating at about 10pm and leave out the Applebee's entrance in the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow. As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags on my arms to find my keys, when a 50-ish year old crusty looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy grey white hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, This is a stick up. Give me all your money. My blood ran cold and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, what? He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters who were standing on the other side of the car, waiting for me to unlock the car to let them in. He then starts making small talk with me and my girls. He is asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all our Christmas shopping done, what kind of things did we get. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or mentally challenged at all. He was very coherent and seemed of sound mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman, alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night, who was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze, talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands digging inside my giant purse for my car keys. This exchange went on for a couple of minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying in vain to find my car keys to get us out of there. They were in there hiding good. I felt that at any moment he was going to pull a knife or gun or rob me and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother on the other side of the car, and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out, and she kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Kids often tend to not recognize potential danger when they're with their parents since they use us as their protectors, and being that he was only talking and acting friendly and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation we all were in, and being nine months pregnant and that I was no match for this full grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, It was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed. And, It was nice meeting you. And telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempts to get this guy to leave wasn't working because he kept sidestepping my attempts and asking them what their favorite school subjects are and how nice young ladies they were, etc., while I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my gigantic cluttered purse for my car keys. My outgoing seven-year-old was completely oblivious to how not okay the situation was because he was being friendly and because of the whole I'm with mommy so I'm safe child mentality. So she started to talk about what she picked out for daddy for Christmas and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was etc and keeping this creep from leaving us alone by keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate to get them out of there. Then I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my keys in the mall, and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away, and I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. 
I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops and I felt like at any moment something was going to go down as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around and that we were totally alone with him and at that moment the odds were stacked against us and that he has his chance. Then he all of a sudden was like, Alright, it was nice talking with you, see you later and walked off in the same direction to which he came. It wasn't until then I found my car keys and unlocked the car and told my kids to get in fast, and I got in too and locked the doors and started the car and drove out of there. My 15-year-old lightheartedly and jokingly said, Okay, that was weird, and laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief, and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it's totally acceptable to go out of his way to just approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night just to chit-chat? But being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went, and I said it went well, and my 15-year-old told him what had happened in the parking lot and how weird it was and was kind of joking about it. I started joking too, saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm, and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white, and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm and I assured him that, albeit creepy, the guy was just talking and eventually left on his own. Now my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school. He decided to go to business school instead of becoming a cop, and being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop for a dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. My husband told me that he was 100% sure that the reason why the guy was hanging around us and chit-chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock the car, and the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids and hold a knife or gun to them to gain leverage on me to force me to cooperate knowing that I wouldn't abandon my kids, which would force me to get into the car with them and do whatever he wanted to me which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do God knows what. And being that he wasn't wearing a mask, suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my seven-year-old was standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why this guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys, and the longer it took the more anxious and spooked it made him. And the whole time, I was desperate to find my keys, which, through some sort of divine intervention, stayed hidden in my purse, thus saving us from potentially being abducted. My fiancé and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single-story ranch house could handle. We'd also just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said that he would bring everything, 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine as long as he was finished by 5 because my kitchen is centrally located in... We'd prefer everyone to be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. He said that would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at 12pm. We gave him until 5 and the guests aren't even arriving until 6, so it's plenty of time. He smelled like actual dog poop, but his accent sounded European so I thought maybe he just didn't believe in deodorant. It was more than a sweat smell though. It smelled like a sun-baked diaper. And that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for priorly sick and young kids. 
I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices, worrying I was being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guests right after, so setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest. We flew in her sister and I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out, and just a million other little details. So every ten minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? With is fine, whatever you think. Taste it to be sure. Was getting old. When he was still there at 5.45, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by 6, no matter what. He apologized and said that there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional. Maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before six rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him whatever's done is done, and whatever isn't, he should just put in the fridge, but he's nowhere to be found. I got out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there, alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a tea and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him he needed to leave, now. So he goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him I'm not comfortable with him going in my room, but he insists it'll only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiancé got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him, nearly in tears at that point, and he was like, What? He went in the bedroom? Why? So he pounded on the door and the caterer came out, still in a t-shirt and jeans, and my fiancé said, You should not be here, you need to leave. And the caterer said, Excuse me? This isn't your house, it's not up to you to decide. And my six foot four, 260 pound fiancé tells him, Yes, actually, it is his house, and puts his hand on his back and guides him to the door. And the caterer says, I, I thought she lived here. And he says, yes, my fiancé lives here with me. And the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I let him on and calling me all sorts of terrible names. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiancé says, oh no, you won't talk to that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and on the floor. At that point, my fiancé realized two of his brothers, both currently offensive linemen at the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came inside and he basically said that this guy was harassing his fiancé. Since they're a family of all boys and my fiancé is the first to get married... They don't get to flex their protective muscles too often and jumped at the chance to toss this guy out. The party then went out as planned, but I insisted we just ordered pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiancé and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much? But I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home at around 3am and passed out in our room. At around 5am I was woken up to the sound of the door opening. I figured either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother have a key. But his parents never, ever, ever let themselves in when they know we're home and his brother had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving it around at 5am. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open. It had been tranquil all night. 
so I wake up my fiancé and whisper, Someone just came in the house. And he said the same thing. Uh, Probably just my brother left his wallet or something. I figured I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiancé was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear the distinct accent. Hey, hello. And I realize it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiancé, or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are just me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges towards me when he sees me. My fiancé gets between me and him and I call 911. Fiancé tells him that the cops have been called and that it's in his best interest to get off the property. Caterer says, No, I have to make sure that she's okay. And I say, What? Why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiancé rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiancé stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us onto the floor. Fiancé didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way, so the caterer couldn't make any assault claims. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point, and when the cops come in, he is a butcher knife. My fiancé considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife since we lived in our stand-your-ground state, but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. Caterer doesn't obey police orders to drop his weapon, and he says he isn't leaving without me, so they tase him. It's lucky for him he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love, and it figures I chose a macho thug over a sweet, sensitive artist like him, and all women are... Etc., etc., etc. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything is missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing. But then I remember he was in our room yesterday and go through the room. All my panties from the dirty laundry hamper were gone and my vibrator had been moved from where I kept it. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean of the whole house. So glad we decided not to serve the food to our guests and my fiancé's medically fragile mother. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police who helped us get issued a no-contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison five years ago, so he's out by now, but thankfully, we haven't seen him since. So I, a 19-year-old female, was at a house party a couple of days ago. I only really knew a couple of people there and it was packed. I hung around with my two friends there for a while having some drinks. After a while my friends went into this room that everyone was hotboxing. I didn't go because I really don't feel like drinking and being stoned at a party where I barely knew anyone. So I just mingled for a bit then went on my phone talking to my other friends. I noticed this guy that keeps staring at me up and down and instantly felt my stomach sink. I'm no stranger to people trying to catch my eye to strike conversation or flirt, but I instantly had a bad feeling about this guy. I looked back down at my phone and sent my location to my friends, just letting them know where I was because things were changing from feeling chill to sketchy. There was a bunch of cans of soda in the kitchen, so I got up to grab a Sprite instead of having any more drinks. I brought my own alcohol, I never take drinks from strangers. As I'm there, the same guy that kept looking at me comes in and started trying to get me to take this drink in a red Solo cup. I was like, nah, I have a Sprite, thanks though. He kept trying though, and 
I was getting annoyed because he kept being super pushy and I'm really blunt so I was like, look, I don't want your drink or your company and walked away. I thought that that would be the end of it and pushed it to the back of my mind as one of my friends came out from the hot box room stoned and happy. We hung out some more and my friend wanted a cigarette so I went out to the balcony with her. As we're there, she put her cigarettes on the ledge and as she's talking animatedly, her arm pushed her cigarettes off and they fell down into the yard. I was going to go downstairs and outside with her to get them but she told me that she had to grab something from her car anyways and that she'd be right back. I decided just to wait there for her. I'm on my phone and I hear the door open and I expected it to be her. As I'm about to say, that was quick. I spin around and am face to face with that guy from earlier. He just grabbed my face and kissed me. And I pushed at his chest and said, Dude, did you not hear what I just said? He proceeded to say something in Spanish. I can't speak Spanish, but... I could pick up a few words he was saying like puta and coño. I had a friend who was an exchange student and she taught me all of the naughty words. I told him to screw off and went to push past him to go back inside and he proceeded to push me up against the wall outside and try to kiss on my neck. That's when I pushed him away as hard as I could but he then let go of my wrists and grabbed my throat hard while maintaining eye contact and smirking at me the whole time. Just when he used his other hand and grabbed my butt, my friend came back from getting her cigarettes, poked her head out and saw what was happening, and she tried to intervene but he pushed her with his other hand. I heard her scream obscenities and she tried to grab the closest guy to the door from inside and brought him out. A random heroic guy from inside then grabbed the crazy throat grabber, putting him in some kind of hold and started screaming at him. He got kicked out pretty sure someone punched him in the face too. Everyone was super apologetic and said they didn't even know that guy and weren't sure who he even was. I wasn't about to call the cops or anything because like I wasn't going to get that party busted but I went to the bathroom and immediately broke down crying. Called my friends. My friends here weren't sober enough to drive and they came to get me. I have a couple of finger mark bruises on my neck still and I hate to think of what would have happened had my friend been distracted by something and not came outside when she did. At least I know my intuitions work great, but let me just say, I'm not going to a party where I barely know anyone anymore. It's just not worth it. This story happened to me around six months ago. I have lived where I live for three years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the late 90s. The last few years, the city I live in has had a massive population boom, and people have been non-stop pouring in. Good weather, amazing economy, cool place to do stuff always. And because of this, I have seen the landlord's staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date to attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like six years before he ended up buying a house and moved. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is there are two stories. Where my bedroom is, on the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase in my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up against that wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling to. For weeks I would always see the workers over there painting and redoing the floors. A few days before this happened was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance on the kitchen and when I came home from work they were gone for the day. Nothing unusual a single bit. The part that is unusual is what happened one particular night. I was awake at around 1am watching TV in my room when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up the stairs and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall. I could feel him listening to me, breathing. I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. 
I heard nothing for a few minutes and then, after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person start walking the rest of the stairs to the second floor. My survival instinct kicked in instantly. It was very obvious that someone was on the other side of that wall listening to me. I also knew that it was only a few days before this happened that I saw the maintenance men redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew that there was no way someone already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes, just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all. Nothing. I went back into my room and laid down in bed again. I didn't play the TV, I just sat there waiting to hear something again. I was messing around on my phone for around 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement in the stairs again. This time though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I was sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall listening to my every move. This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched out the window again. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building and apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after could hear him talking to someone, but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I went downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop that it was one way to meet your new neighbor. I felt embarrassed, but more importantly felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed the whole thing off as it just being late in my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day I went to leave my apartment when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps towards my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment and looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked over to a maintenance man and said, didn't someone move in here? And he informed me no that the apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone is staying there and she said absolutely not. I told her about what I experienced the night before. She was floored. She told me that they would change that apartment's locks immediately. She also suggested that I call the non-emergency line to the police department and inform them that no one lives there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information and detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out what officer came out to check out that situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed that I have never seen him around the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it and started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in, and they're very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went out to introduce myself to them, but to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping the following weeks of that happening to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I have zero idea what the intentions of that person was or what he was doing in that staircase, but it's easily one of the most chilling things that have ever happened to me. Way back in 1991, I was in my second year of high school. 
I volunteered to assist students who had special needs back then. I read textbooks aloud and recorded the audio for students with visual impairments, acted as a sign language interpreter for a deaf classmate, and helped out with two classes for students with cognitive impairments. It was through this volunteer work that I met T. T had quite severe cerebral palsy, used a power wheelchair, and was visually impaired. I began as a textbook reader for her. It soon became quite obvious that she didn't really have any friends, as most of the kids who were not disabled really avoided those kids who were. There was a lot of bullying of the students with disabilities. Soon I began to accompany T to her classes in order to help her avoid jerks, especially when it became known that she kept some of the morphine pills she needed for severe chronic pain in the bag on the back of her wheelchair. Guys began trying to steal those pills, even resorting to violence. Because T was nearly blind, she could not identify the jerks who attacked her. If I was with her, they didn't try. I felt bad for her. She was very isolated as her family lived a long way outside of town, and the local mobility bus would not go that far. All weekends and all holidays, she was stuck at home while the rest of us got to go hang out with friends. So I started being a friend. I gave her my home number, so at least she had someone to talk to on weekends. Over the next couple of years, that became kind of an unequal friendship. She was a talker. If I had plans with other friends, she would moan about how she had no one else, how depressed she was, how she was going to end her own life. It was really strange, just how she always seemed to know when I had plans with other friends. If I wanted to go out with them, she'd know and call me and guilt me into dropping them to stay on the phone with her. I mean, she always knew, and I could never figure out how. Being the naive, socially inept kid that I was, I'm autistic and social stuff is especially difficult for me, I fell for this manipulation. I'd get guilted out and cancel my plans with my real friends so I could stay on the phone with her. I didn't even like talking on the phone. My other friends and my mother did try to warn me that the way she was acting, dominating my time and manipulating me was unhealthy and not the way a real friend acted, but I felt like I had to defend her to them as she had nobody else. I found her exhausting and I was having mental health struggles of my own, but I kept quiet and never spoke about my increasing anxiety, self-injury, depression, and certain impulses. I didn't want to be mistaken for being anything like T, who brought up her abuse. I really do think that she made all of that stuff up, as the details changed with every telling. Her depression and the attempts that she had done to end her own life, whenever she wasn't getting what she wanted, so I didn't tell anyone how desperate and depressed I felt, and I hid my self-injuries. Looking back on it, I really did need help, but I kept it all secret. Partway through my fourth year of high school and her third, she moved into a local supportive living home for people who had disabilities, who needed help with things like dressing, bathing, meal prep, etc. Now that she was living right in my own town, there was no escape. I couldn't do anything with anyone without her finding out about it and guilting me over it. You don't care about me, just like everyone else. I just want to hurt myself. No one wants me around, so I may as well just die. Things like that. Jeesh. Eventually, if she called the house phone, no mobile phones back then, thank fate, or I'd have had no freedom at all from her. My parents would always say I wasn't home, even if I was. They gave excuses like me being at piano lessons or my figure skating lessons or at my job or at a local diner. If T got my mother on the phone, she would try to do to my mom what she was doing to me. Thankfully, Mom was far better at setting boundaries than her daughter was, and would only talk with T for a few minutes before giving a polite excuse and hanging up. Finally, I graduated. I chose a university that was a good three-hour drive away from home, in part to avoid T. She would not be able to get to my new city. My room was in a building that was not wheelchair accessible, and there would be long-distance phone charges. With me away from home and inaccessible... T went after my mother's attention with an unnerving ferocity, calling multiple times every evening. That was the reason my parents finally got caller ID and voicemail, just so that they could avoid answering the phone when T called. 
Years went by and I came back home after university. I began working for the local hospital. Facebook arrived on the scene and I joined up to keep in contact with friends and family who were now living all over the country. I hadn't thought of tea in years. Then she sent a friend request and I felt exactly like I did when I was in high school. Hounded. Needless to say, I blocked her. Eventually I cancelled my Facebook account entirely as she began making fake profiles to attempt to contact me. Thankfully it's been about 10 years since she last attempted to contact me and I have made that difficult. Neither my mother or I are listed in the local phone book. I don't use my real name anywhere online and I am very cautious about giving my mobile number to others. I don't know where she is but I do hope she changed her ways and finally has friends she doesn't have to manipulate into hanging out with her. Ever since I was 14 years old, I have been scared of lightning. It started when I was out in a soccer field during a thunderstorm and lightning struck the fence, just over 100 feet away from me. The sound was deafening and I can still remember the awful sensation of the sound vibrating through my whole body but this wouldn't be my only incident involving a lightning strike that I came too close to. The next time it wouldn't only scare me, it would also be my salvation. When I turned 20, I moved out of my parents, who live in the capital of my country, to a small community in the south, and I have no intention of moving back. Sure, a girl that grew up in the city is used to the endless variation of restaurant, bars, stores that never close, and a city that never sleeps, but I like it here. Despite the low population of the community and something of a sleepy town stamp on it, it is charming with its colorful wooden houses, the seaside campus, and the smell of butter from the old butter factory as an eternal reminder of where you are. I can practically go out whenever I want, wherever I want, and meet a total of ten people, the neighborhood cats, and if I'm lucky, a cute but lost hedgehog. There is one more reason why I appreciate the living in a small town. It is how incredibly safe I feel here. In the city, you can barely be outside alone as a woman after 10pm without feeling such discomfort that you feel compelled to check behind you once or twice every minute. All such discomfort, however, doesn't only happen after said time or during the darkest hours of the day. It can happen at any time. But that is something you learn, something I had to learn. I was 17 and it was the summer holidays. I was spending most of it at my then boyfriend's house and he lived with his family about 20 minutes outside of the city. I lived with my parents at the time in the city center, just along the green subway line so if I wanted to get back home, I had to take the commuter train to the central station, walk across it and switch to the green subway line and ride a few minutes on there to get back to my station. I was then in one of my rebellious periods and had a month before bleached my hair. I loved it at first, but after a while my roots started to show and I realized my mistake. My angel of a mother had tired of my fuss over it and booked me at a hairdresser so that I could go back to my natural deep brown hair color. The day for my appointment at the hairdresser came and I was as usual at my boyfriend's, but I needed something from my parents' apartment first so I put on my headphones and jumped on the commuter train. I switched as usual to the green line and sat near one of the doors that I knew would line up perfectly to where I would get off. I like to crowd watch when I travel, not to stare people out or anything like that, but just to look at people and think about where they are going, what they are doing for work and maybe make up a story about them. It is kind of a game that I often find myself playing on the subway or commuter train. I played that game that day, I looked around at people and where there was one station left until my stop, my eye struck to a man who was sitting a few feet in front of me. He was tall, perhaps in his mid-thirties. His hair was dark and scruffy, wearing dark clothes and big boots. He sat with his elbows leaning against his knees, crouching slightly down towards the subway floor. Today I don't remember what my analysis or fictional story was of him, but I know I saw him. The woman in the speakers shouted out my destination and I stood up and went to the doors and stepped off. When I got out of the doors of the station I saw that it had started to rain. 
So I pulled my hood over the headphones and started to quickly walk up to the apartment, which was only a few hundred feet from the station. The apartment is an old building with a large wooden door facing the street. The door has a glass pane that runs along the entire door, and when you enter the staircase, it is entirely in marble with an old wooden elevator with an iron lattice door that you have to close manually. When I got to the door, I put in the entry code and pushed up the door. When the door was swung aside, something was reflected in the glass. I turned around and saw the man from the subway standing behind me. At first I was a little shocked that he was so close to me, but I assumed he was one of my neighbors or a neighbor's friend. I also assumed that he stood so close to me because it rained and he didn't want to get wet. So I said hello and pressed up the door an extra time with my hip while I took off my headphones. He did not answer. I went to the lift and pressed the button, but I heard that it did not start, so I assumed that the neighbors had opened the lattice door to park the elevator at their floor while they locked their door. I turned around and saw the man standing behind me, shaking. It was not a typical type of shaking that's common if you have a fever or a cold, but more like a spastic twitching. He stood there jerking, with his head and his back as curved as he had on the subway, but this time his eyes were not on the floor, they were on me. He opened his mouth to talk, but only incoherent sounds came out while the shaking and jerking became more frantic. What's your name? he said at last. I remember my parents' words of wisdom to never tell your name to a stranger, especially one whom one feels threatened by. I wanted to tell him to go, but I felt like I was frozen and provoking him might make the situation worse. I replied with a false name. He then asked, Do you live here? I lied and answered that I don't and that I'm just here to see a friend. I remember thinking I was smart. Now he didn't know my name or where I lived, I thought, but it was now he started moving closer to me. I started backing. He must have seen the fear in my eyes, but he continued, scuffing towards me. I heard the elevator engine start ticking and that it was on its way down. He told me he has been following me on the train and that he saw me there and that he just had to follow me. It was now that he lifted his head from his previous position, showing how tall he really was and the shaking stopped. He spoke again. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. If I thought I was frozen before, that was an understatement. I was now pressed against the elevator door and he was so close that I could feel his scent. Some may think that these words still have to be somewhat flattering, but the way he said it, it sounded like a death sentence, like something real bad. Bad for me. It was about when I heard the elevator stop on the first floor and someone walked down the stairs to the courtyard door. That door is located on a small platform between the ground floor and the first floor stairs. You also know how you can recognize and distinguish your parents' step from others. I did with this with these steps that came down the stairs and heard that they were my father's. I quickly thought that I would scream for him, but then I realized that the man would know that I first lied, and that he might get angry and do something to my old father. That was when my father opened the door to the courtyard and the lightning struck the yard. The sound waves of the cracking lightning pressed itself through the open door and made the whole marble stairwell scream. I screamed. The man screamed. I went to my usual position regarding thunder and lightning, fetal position on the floor. He, on the other hand, jumped backwards and started running out, while he shouted that we will be seeing each other again soon. I barely realized what had happened. I went crying up in the elevator and into the apartment where I told everything to my mother and also father when he came up from the courtyard. We reported the incident to the police and I went and dyed my hair, which made me feel a little safer as my appearance changed quite drastically. I was still a little scared after the incident, but also confused. I just kept thinking about what he was saying when he ran out. We will be seeing each other again soon. I knew at least that I absolutely did not want to see him again. However, I didn't get what I wanted. About a month passed and I had practically forgotten about the situation. I was on my way to the central station to meet up with my boyfriend who was on the commuter train on his way to me. 
I stood and waited for him in the hallway between the commuter train and the subway. In that particular hallway, a lot of people are walking, either to the trains or from the trains. Very few people are standing still in it. As I said, I stood there, looked down the hallway from time to time to try to see if my boyfriend had come yet, when I see someone else standing still. There was someone standing on the other side of the crowd, and although everyone goes in different directions and creates a kind of blurred effect on him, I see who it is. I freeze just like before. He stares at me, not like our first meeting, but as if he's trying to make up if I am who he thinks I am, behind the dark hair. Then my boyfriend comes from the crowd and hugs me, and I have to look away from the man a few seconds to hug him back. I lean my head against his shoulder and look over to see if the man was still there, but then he was gone. I have never seen him since, but the real question is, has he seen me? This happened to me a couple of years ago. At the time, my fiancé didn't believe me, but I'd been convinced for several weeks that someone was watching our house. Several Amazon packages stolen, cigarette butts by the front door when neither of us smoke, doormat has been moved. We had just moved to the area recently, and I was really uneasy about all of this. My fiancé teased me for watching too many murder mysteries and crime shows, and I eventually dropped the subject. One night, we're in bed together, nearly asleep. Our cat starts being really loud, so my fiancé gets up to feed her and realizes we forgot to get cat food while we were out earlier. We both feel guilty about going to sleep knowing she's hungry, so he tells me not to worry. He'll run over to the little 24-hour convenience store that's maybe five minutes down the street. He gets dressed to leave, and I roll over to go back to sleep. I'm laying on my side in bed facing our window, and as he leaves... I can see his shadow on the blinds as he walks down the sidewalk. Didn't know it yet, but he forgot to lock the door. Maybe a minute or two after he leaves, I see his shadow pass by the bedroom window again and hear footsteps coming back up the sidewalk. I figured since he was tired, he probably forgot his wallet and had to come back. This has happened before. I chuckled to myself at how forgetful he is and the front door opens. My cat jumps off the bed to go and greet him. What happened next took place over the span of maybe three minutes, but felt like three days. It was dark and dead quiet in our house, quiet enough I could hear my cat's little steps on the bedroom carpet suddenly stop. She then lets out the deepest, most terrifying growl I had ever heard a cat make. At this point, I hear a person take a few steps into our living room, shush her, and sneeze. It is definitely not my fiancé. I'm a woman, alone, at night, naked in bed, scared out of my mind, and I have no idea what to do. This guy clearly knows my fiancé is out. Does he know I'm home alone? Is he here to kidnap or hurt me? My phone had died earlier, of course, so it's off and plugged into the charger. I know once I turn it on... AT&T's incredibly loud jingle is going to betray me, so for right now I'm on my own. Thankfully, we keep a shotgun by our bed. I slip out of bed, grab my gun, and crawl as quietly as I can toward the bedroom door, which was about two-thirds of the way closed. I can hear the creep rummaging through our stuff in the living room, and he sneezes again. This idiot... I peek through the gap in the door and the outside light is just barely bright enough to illuminate a man hunched over our entertainment center, his back to me. I silently open the door the rest of the way and stand up, still 100% naked and 100% determined to keep myself and my cat safe. I muster all my stupidity and courage and cock the shotgun, and in the deepest booming voice my body will allow me to make, I bellow out, What do you think you're doing? I've never seen a human jump so hard or run so fast. I scared the creep so badly he about launched himself into orbit. I got one good look at his back as he ran outside into the darkness and then he was gone. I slammed the door shut behind him and yanked my terrified cat out from under the couch by the neck. 
we booked it back to the bedroom with my gun. I held her so close to my chest and just started sobbing while I struggled to turn my phone on and dial 911. My fiancé got home with a can of cat food moments later and immediately noticed the PS4 on the ground and other electronics moved around. He found me in the bedroom flipping out and I barely got any words out to explain what happened before the cops showed up. They were super nice but unfortunately there wasn't much else they could do. They didn't have a lot to go on as I hadn't seen the man's face at all and couldn't really give them a solid description. Fortunately, none of our stuff actually ended up being taken and more importantly my cat and I were both okay. However, we were positive the creep lived in our area as a few weeks later, someone we knew up the street was robbed in the exact same way. He left his door unlocked for a moment to run to the store, came back and all of his electronics had been stolen. I'm not sure if they ever caught the creeper. We got out of that neighborhood pretty quick. Just remember, lock your doors, people. I always tell this as a cautionary tale that has actually happened to me, especially in light of all the terrifying, heartbreaking news stories of girls who get into Ubers and are never seen again. This happened when I was in college. It's one of the bigger party schools with an entire street of bars you can wander to and from. My boyfriend, now fiancé, had gone back to his hometown for the weekend, so I decided to go out with some friends. I'm sure you can see where this is going. I had a bit too much to drink and was on the edge of a blackout. Knowing with my whole mind, body, and soul that I did not want to become a liability for my friends for the rest of the night, I told them I was going to Uber home. My friends insisted on coming home with me, but selfishly I wanted to call my boyfriend when I got home and have a bed to myself so I could tell them all no, but took a screenshot of my driver's name and info on the app and sent it to them. When it got close, I hugged them all and walked out the door. Like I said earlier, it's a big party school with a lot of bars in one area, so the entire strip is lined with Ubers from about 11pm to 3. It was also bar closed, so there were a ton, and look, I was hammered. I don't even know what a Toyota Yaris looks like at the best of times, so as I'm searching, a man rolled down his window and asked if I was waiting for an Uber. I said yes. He told me he wasn't my Uber, but if I cancelled my ride and accepted his, then he would take me home. I was already thinking of the leftovers I had in my fridge at this point, so I agreed, cancelled my Uber, and linked my account up with his. He was super nice, and he was an Uber. I've heard stories of fake Uber drivers, so I did make sure he was legit. He called me beautiful a few times right off the bat, but hey, I was a girl in college, I get that a lot. I remember we talked about our favorite books. I told him I was an English major and he was super interested in listening to me talk about tutoring ESL students in my free time on campus. He was an immigrant who had to learn to speak English so we lamented about how awful it is to learn such an intricate language but how rewarding the successes were in the end. When he missed the turn in from my apartment complex I figured it must have been because he was distracted by our conversation. I politely pointed out that he missed the turn in and he said that he turned back around. Rather than making a U-turn though, he took the longest way to get back to my apartment. I was still in familiar territory so I at least knew that he was going in the right direction but I was starting to get nervous. It was around 2.30 at this time and it was super dark and no one was awake let alone outside. When he missed the turn in again, I asked if I could just get out and make it back on my own. He seemed kind of offended, like he was surprised that I wasn't as engrossed in our conversation as he was. I kind of jokingly told him that I was a broke college student and he was racking up my bill during a surge. That seemed to straighten things out a bit. He was all, oh, I completely understand, and turned back toward my complex. I was honestly so freaked out and drunk at this point that as soon as he pulled into my complex, I was like, okay, right here is fine, thank you, and pulled in the door handle when he came to a stop. It didn't open. I hit the little lock latch. Still nothing. Let's go get coffee. 
he said. He clicked the button in the app to say that the trip was completed and clicked out of the app. At this point, I'm just trying not to look as freaked out as I felt. I told him I was tired and it was late and coffee was the last thing I needed at the moment. I tried the door again, just to make sure I wasn't drunk and handling the door wrong. Still didn't open. We should just sit here and talk until you're feeling better, he explained to me. We can go somewhere more private too if you'd like. Do you live alone up there? At this point, I'm frantically digging through my purse from my phone. I'm done being polite. When he asked what I was doing, I told him I promised my boyfriend I'd call him once I was home safely. Wrong thing to say. He got incredibly angry that I had a boyfriend and didn't tell him about it. He asked what his name was, what he did for a living, and where he was right now at this very second. When I gave half-hearted answers, he got even angrier. He demanded to know why a boyfriend of mine would be stupid enough to leave his girl alone with another man, him. He repeated it twice. At this point, I'm trying not to cry. When I figured my phone must have fallen under the seat, I started digging around down there. He demanded to know what I was doing. I gave my best impression of a genuine laugh and said I dropped my phone. He told me to stop digging around in his things immediately. I stopped. Mind you, I'm still drunk as a skunk at this point. I was just trying to keep my stuff together and not vomit or pass out. I tried the door a third time. Still nothing. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again. Even kind of begged a little. I told him no, I just needed sleep. He asked if I lived alone again. I lied and told him I had a roommate. He asked if it was my boyfriend and I said no. He kind of got angry again and then straight up asked if I'd made my boyfriend up. I told him no and he got angrier and again asked why he would leave me alone with another man like this. I'm usually pretty good at reading people and I got the vibe that this guy thought he was a knight compared to my boyfriend. So I lied. Through my teeth, I told him I was going to break things off with my boyfriend and that we weren't even really that serious. That he was an idiot to leave me alone like this. Thank whatever God was watching over me, but that did it. He calmed down and said that changed things. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again and changed my answer to not tonight. He asked for my number and I gave it to him. He called to make sure it was my real number. My phone buzzed from between my seat and the door and I fished it out. He grabbed my phone from me and demanded I show him my boyfriend's contact info. When I did, he deleted it and gave me a big smile. Feels good, doesn't it? I told him yes. He put his number in my phone and gave it back. I told him goodnight in hopes that he would release me and he told me he liked to talk for just a little longer. I had to stay locked in that car with him until 4.30 in the morning. I don't even remember what we talked about. He asked if he could hold my hand at one point, to which I said I needed to break up with my boyfriend before I did anything with another man. He liked that answer, thankfully. When he finally let me out, the door was child-locked, so could only be opened from the outside. The windows were locked, too. I walked up the wrong building's steps and crouched down in the shadows of some random person's door until he drove off. I sat for another ten minutes and then sprinted to my apartment. After crying on the floor in my kitchen for a while, I called my boyfriend and explained to him what happened. His response was one that I get from everyone when I tell this story. Report that guy to Uber. And even though he didn't know which building in my complex I lived in, he still knew where I lived. I was terrified of seeing him again. I was terrified of calling an Uber. To this day, I refuse to Uber alone, and I make sure I have my phone in my hand every time I get into an Uber now. I realized this could have been a lot worse, and maybe he was a good guy with the wrong line of thinking and he did mean well, but I was terrified I wasn't going to make it to my apartment that night. Please be cautious when getting an Uber, and don't be like me. I spent all night reading through these yesterday. Some of these stories are truly bizarre. It inspired me to write about an incident that normally I hate to even talk about because it is honestly one of the most disturbing things that I had ever experienced. This all started in January of 2019, so 
relatively recent. For some background context, I am a young gay man living in a very populated city, so weird things are bound to happen, especially when using the gay dating app Grindr. I'm sure you've all heard of it. When this started, I was living in a biggish city in northern Florida, but had plans to move the next week. My two friends had come down to celebrate my moving away and also one of their birthdays. We hung out in my city for a day and then drove to Miami together. It was a lot of fun for the most part, but this story begins on the last day of my vacationing there. We were at a brunch place preparing to say goodbye to the city and drive back home so I could pack my things and relocate to where I live now, and I received a notification from Grinder, saying that I had received a new message. I opened it up and the message simply said, Hi, or something of the sort. It was from a blank profile, and it said it was sent using a feature called Explore, meaning this person wasn't located in Miami but lived elsewhere. I replied, not minding the faceless profile, because a lot of men on that app are not open with their sexuality and might not want to take a risk of people in their actual life finding out about them. We make small talk, exchange names and such, and he seemed like a really nice person. He eventually sent me a few pictures of him, and he was very attractive looking. He asked me for my number, and I was so flustered by Miami and saying goodbye to our temporary friends that I just gave it to him without thinking about what could have come of it, and I regret this dearly. We texted over the next few days, and things seemed pretty normal. We talked a lot, just casual chit-chat, asking about our careers, goals, etc. Nothing strange. And then I noticed a notification from the Cash app that I had received $100 from a random username that I didn't recognize. The memo was an eggplant emoji. Gross. I was so confused and started texting my friends, telling them how a random person had just accidentally sent me a hundred bucks, and how he'd have to keep sending me more in order to ask me to return it because you can only communicate with someone on the app if it includes a payment. We got a laugh about this, and I decided just to return the money because I would be really upset if I was on the other end of the equation and I had just graciously donated that amount of money to a random person. Before I was able to do that, though, my new grinder friend texted me and said, Don't ask me for any more. That's all I can give you. I will block you if you ask me to send you more. I was confused. I had never asked this man for money. I have no idea how he even got my Cash App username. I know you can look people up using their phone numbers, but I hadn't even linked my new phone number to that app yet. I replied asking him how he got my information, but... He wouldn't say anything about it. I guess I just dropped it because, eh, free money. And I'm an idiot for that. Time goes on and things are getting a little weird between our texts. He begins asking me to send him pictures of my feet, which in and itself isn't weird. I don't like to kink shame, but something just felt very off about him at this point. It's as if I was talking to a new person. I tell him that he needs to calm down a bit and that this was getting uncomfortable for me, to which he agrees. Time goes by and eventually he insinuates that I should move back to Florida, to the city where he was located so that he could take care of me. I firmly decline, which he says, well, then I will come to you. At this point, my alarm bells are going off and I'm thinking, I've got to put an end to this. I don't reply right away and... He tells me he's always wanted to come to my current city. What? How do you know where I live? I didn't give him any of my social media, and even if I had, there's no way he could have known because I intentionally withheld any information online about me relocating, as I was tired of everyone knowing my business. I have always had my location on Grinder set to off, so he couldn't see where I was or even how many miles away I was from him. I told him that at this point, he needs to leave me alone and that I didn't wish to talk to him. I didn't block him though because I was starting to get paranoid and wanted to have a record of the things he would continue to say in case things got super weird, which of course it did. First, he told me he was sorry for lying and sent me a few pictures of what is actually him. I hate to sound like a jerk, but something was seriously off with the way this person looked. Almost every picture had a very big, disturbing, ecstatic smile and 
big wide eyes staring directly into the camera, very close up. He was probably in his 30s and looked like he didn't care for himself very well. His skin was uneven and gray and had a short beard that looked like it hadn't had maintenance at all, if that makes any sense. One of them looks like it might have been an accident because his face was blurry and he was angrily just staring into the camera with a hateful, evil expression on his face. He also sent me one of his mouth, but only his big smile pictured. Nothing else was in it. There were pictures of his apartment as well, and it looked almost empty other than a small table with a photograph of unknown people in it. Also, a fire hydrant was there. It was all very weird. I didn't reply to these, and that resulted in a string of angry texts from him telling me he wished he'd never met me and that he hates me. Throughout all of the weird, uncomfortable, and filthy texts he sent me, there are a few exceptionally disturbing things. He sent me a link to his YouTube page, which I did end up viewing, and the videos were literally just him talking to himself and making jokes to himself. There were ten plus of them, and I was the first viewer, although they'd been up for months. If that wasn't weird enough, whenever he would pause in between sentences in these videos, I would hear faintly in the background what sounded like someone's muffled screaming, and every so often, after hearing the screaming, I would hear him try to hold back a very high-pitched, sinister laughter that sounded nothing like him. I could tell from the sound quality that it was something this man was producing and not a bystander. I also don't think he has many friends. Most of these videos have since been deleted and I don't know why. I write poetry and at some point he was begging me to send him poetry. He also sent me a link to his WordPress which I also viewed and the poems were somehow actually very well written, like extremely beautiful poems but I realized that the things he was saying in them made absolutely no sense. I tried analyzing them any way I could because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this guy and none of them made sense. He would randomly send me small amounts of money on the app, I guess in an attempt to get me to talk to him. Fast forward a little bit. The timeline is slightly messy because this was just a constant stress on me and I was still receiving a message from him every 10 minutes that I wasn't replying to. These were weird. Here's what some of them said. Did you block me? You want to put me out of your life? That's fine, but it's an irreversible decision. When you push me out of your life, you don't get me back in when you feel dumb about it later, and you will. I am the best thing that happened to you in years. It is a privilege to know me. You want to clear space out for someone more deserving because you're an uppity little prick? Not a problem. You're not getting rid of me. Stuff like that. I withheld some of the more vile and descriptive ones depicting what he would do to me sexually because I don't like to read them or even think about them. He would also reply to his own texts almost instantly and apologize for what he said and told me please don't go and things like that. I finally broke down and told one of my best friends about this, who was also gay but very muscular and protective of me. I don't know. He just makes me feel safe somehow and I didn't know who else to tell. He immediately got really mad and took my phone and called him. Best friend told him aggressively that he was my boyfriend, which makes no sense because I wouldn't be on Grinder if I had a boyfriend, and that creeper Grinder guy needed to stop reaching out. Grinder guy is silent and then suddenly starts hysterically laughing and making the most inhumane, god awful noises I had ever heard speaking sentences that were English but with words that didn't make any sense together at all and just really creeped us out. The look on my friend's face still gave me chills. He never gets uncomfortable but he was just staring at me with this blank expression and it was in this moment that I realized that I should have just blocked this man as soon as I realized that something was off. I didn't know what to do I guess. After the call he texts me a lot of horrible things and then says sorry, and this is a cycle for about 15 minutes until he sends me this. The private Facebook message you may see were all written before our conversation via text and phone tonight, so naturally disregard them and my name. I just block him. I have no idea what he was on about with the Facebook thing. I looked and couldn't find anything. This final exchange happened about a month and a half ago. 
I thought this was the end. Up until about two weeks ago, I was exploring a nearby large city. There are a lot of big cities around me, and I'm basically in the middle of them. With that same best friend. We were walking out of a museum, and I see someone that looked very familiar leaning against a cement wall to the left of the big stairs that was the entry to the museum. He was staring at us, but I couldn't make anything out of it. I ignored it and we hopped on the bus to take us to a nearby restaurant for lunch. It wasn't until we got to the restaurant that I realized who this man was. It was him, the creepy grinder guy. I was sure of it. I have no idea how he knew where I was, but I knew he traveled over a thousand miles to come to the area I was living in. I didn't mention it to my friend because I'm seriously really creeped out, but I think I'm going to tell him when we hang out again because I don't want anything to happen to him, either. Luckily, I'm moving again in a few weeks, this time very, very far away. I'm considering taking this all to the police, but I don't know if I really have options. This has been the weirdest and most uncomfortable experience of my life. I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies and a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often I load us up in the van and drive ten minutes to the wooded metro park. I love it there. They offered some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some bicycles and skis, some just people and... Last year they opened up a new one that allows pets. It's a five mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark with no leaves on the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for the most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits and rangers patrolling regularly, and the hospital behind CVS means there is some emergency medical care and walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and was not fully recovered when the sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part, so we're walking, not yet jogging again, but after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. Then my youngest had an appointment, then I had to run a few errands, and then we had unexpected visitors right after school, and then they stayed for dinner and... Finally, I got the dogs into the van, and we made it to the park just before it started to get dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day, but as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized we'd be walking the sunset, watching it over the lakes and the hills and through the bare trees. And the park was clearing out now, as it started towards dark, we would very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who were afraid of dogs hiked the pet path. All of those little irritations had led up to the singular moment of beauty I would not otherwise have seen and appreciated. This was going to be a really good walk. Funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot at the furthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms, a mile-long, people, walkers or joggers only path looped through the woods and by the lake and came up by the bathrooms. I liked to run it when I came here alone. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods. My feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky. I absolutely loved it. About halfway now and the city's sounds had faded away till I could only hear the birds and frogs and insects all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. Crack. Utter silence and absolute stillness. My dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature's sounds to return, and they did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, first standing on end all around their shoulders and necks, tails held tall and proud, 
making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me down the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put ears back and heads down and began to pull me, so off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have started a buck on the slope of the hill, not seen him, and after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree, and his hoof hit a dead branch, and the branch broke, crack, and scared everyone. Why were the woods still silent? Maybe there's someone up there. Homeless people must stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far as the path goes. It would have been a good place to sleep. Maybe he's setting up a shelter and... Crack. Broke a branch. Why were the woods still silent? We're about as far from the city as we could get in these woods and you couldn't see the CVS sign or the glow from the street lights or even hear the traffic noises. It was dark and still and absolutely quiet, except for the panting dogs and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run. Bigfoot. That was a Bigfoot breaking a log to say get out. There are no Bigfoot in city limits, I promise you that, Brain. It was a deer. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog here, yes, they're the big huskies, and another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves. I can lift 100 pounds over my head. We are the scariest things in these woods. There's no bear, there's no wolves, there's no Bigfoot. There are deer, there are foxes. And there might be an angry raccoon, but we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing in these woods. Unless there's someone with a gun. Shut up, brain, you're not helping, I say to myself. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We got almost a mile now. Me craning my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could in all directions while letting the dogs pull me down the path, and it was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose, not a cricket, nothing moved, nothing made a sound, except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on this trail. I had been running through these to rebuild my strength and endurance, but if I ran this, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested and you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where if you were deeper in the woods you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait, unseen for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around? It was just a deer. What if it's behind us? Ambush. Deer. Gun. Bigfoot. And this is why I run. The noises in my head are unbearable otherwise. Up the hill, walk, pay attention, watch the dogs. The dogs were still on alert but didn't hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just walk, don't get smoked, be able to run or fight if you have to. Yeah, okay, I'm scared too. The woods should not still be silent. The dogs should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's Bigfoot, but it could be a person. So let's be smart. Just just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will, and they'll follow his lead. Be smart and get out. Only another mile now to the lake in the first parking lot. Then another half mile along to the lake to the second lot where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets, no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic and... Oh no. Poop. Poop and blood or partially digested grass. I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted these woods. The dogs were not at all interested in the smell. We ran. I don't remember much of that last mile, we just ran. Desna, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. 
and she began to sniff and pee. The boys followed her lead. There was a single truck parked. I relaxed quite a bit, but still felt on edge. Down the lake in the next parking lot I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake. Their headlights illuminated the lakeside path. They're watching us. Halfway to the van now and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrests and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it with an absolute certainty. Finally the dogs were in. I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt, starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas, and as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebars. A gun. A deer carcass. I couldn't tell. And because of the angle when pulling away, I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror at all. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And always remember that big Zodiac energy.